So, should you say something or? I don't actually know. I just all that I all that I know about this wonderful gentleman here is that he's a professor from Massachusetts, and he has studied parts of Indonesian culture, specifically a few knows a few things relating to bamboo. But I don't I don't know much more than that, so That's... I think I might have to hand it over from okay. there. Okay. <laughs> okay. But it was enough to make me know that we had to hear what he had to say. Well, this is um, both a thrill and, well, it's a thrill, it's an honor, and it's a little awkward because I've been talking about you guys behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'm counting on you correcting the things that I've been saying uh, so that I don't keep making the same mistakes. Okay. So this is a great opportunity to, um, to fix it. So I'm hoping you don't hold back, interrupt me, whatever. When, when you hear something wrong, say something, okay? Um, my name is Robert Cowherd. I uh, am an architect, but before I was an architect, I went to engineering school. Uh, before I went to engineering school, I was a builder. I built in concrete, wood, steel, I did the plumbing, the electrical. I just wanted to learn everything there was to know about building. And I got fired from my job uh, at one point um, after I had studied engineering and uh, decided, oh, time to go to architecture school. So I ended up going to architecture school uh, at two different schools. I uh, ended up in New York City where I finished. and. Um, I'm not going to get into how I ended up in Indonesia, but it was 25 years ago on Tuesday that I got off the plane uh, and went straight to Ubud. And um, I was so excited. So I what just. What year is that? 25 years ago. 91. 1991. Anyone not born yet? <laughs> Most of them. <laughs> so I went for a short walk, and 20 kilometers later, weary, dehydrated. I was bedridden for the next three days because I just overdid it because I was too excited um, to be in, in Bali. I, I went to, the reason, I, I had a three-month grant to do research on Javanese architecture and I uh, ended up staying for four years because I had a chance to work with the royal family in Solo and uh, help renovate and restore the palace and we had the Aga Khan Award for Architecture ceremony there in 1995. Um, and so it was a good stopping point. Then I went back to the United States, this time to Cambridge, where I did a PhD at uh, MIT in history and theory. So um, when I was hired at Wentworth, where I currently teach, also in Boston, they hired me because I am a historian. And uh, I kind of kept it a secret that I had this other life. Um, they're I didn't say anything about Indonesia, I didn't say anything about construction. And so as I told my students um, when we arrived here, I said, now I can come out. My secret <laughs> is out. <clears throat> I love to build things. Secret Indonesia lover. And I love Indonesia. And so it's a, it's a dual secret, at least two. Um, and so, uh, so we are having a fantastic time, and I think I'm having more fun than they are. <laughs> uh, building stuff with bamboo and we feel so lucky and so privileged to be here and have this opportunity uh, to have this experience in Bali. A lot of them have traveled a bit but some of them have never left their propensity. They, they just have never been very far from home before and to come to the other side of the world and to be received and to not have anything to be afraid of it's just, I, it's amazing to see the transformation in these people. Um, so one of the things about being a historian and being in love with Indonesia is it allows me to um, identify really interesting stories. And so here's a story that I wrote up. I gave it to Oren. Oren was fascinated. I'm going to skip a lot of the um, footnotes and big names and concepts and I'm just going to tell it like a story because that's the best way to tell it. And it starts on a Friday night in September 1923 and I don't have to give the whole background what was happening in 1923 
but it was um, Max Havelaar was published in the Netherlands. The Dutch people uh, were waking up in a public widespread way to the injustice and cruelty of colonialism. Queen Wilhelmina declared in 1901 the beginning of the ethical policy. So no longer are we going to just subjugate the people of Indonesia. We are also going to educate. We're going to keep extracting the wealth as fast as possible, but we can hold on to our colonies longer if we also dignify that with some education, some, some uh, development, to use uh, that term. And so on the stage in 1923 in Bandung, in this building, there were two architects. They were Dutch East Indian architects born in Java, educated in the Netherlands at Delft, and then came back to Java to practice. Um, and they were debating each other about what is the right architecture for the ethical policy. The thing everybody agreed on uh, then, everyone on stage, everyone in the audience, all agreed something that would be a little controversial today, oddly enough, which is that architecture is a significant tool for social transformation and for cultural propagation of ideas. And so the debate was not whether there should be an ethical architecture or not. The question was, what is the form? What is the formal vocabulary of an ethical policy architecture? And so um, on one side of the stage was Schumacher. And Schumacher, uh, how many people have heard of Schumacher? He's become famous lately because of a, a book published um, on his work. He's called the Frank Lloyd Wright of Indonesia with some great buildings in um, Bandung. But he said uh, the Dutch are the second great colonial power. The first great colonial power was India. And the second great colonial power ethical policy architecture should be uh, celebrating the great civilization that was the first colonial power of Indonesia. Of course India was not a colonial power, we know. But he said Borobudur Prambanan um, they are clearly great civilizations, and anything else uh, is garbage. There is no such thing as architecture in Indonesia other than these two buildings, is what he said on stage. And he mixed that with um, the science, the pseudoscience of phrenology. It used to be that there were scientists, so-called, who claimed that you could tell if someone was going to be a criminal or not by the shape of their skull. And he said, this is just like phrenology. You can tell that this is a great civilization, and you can tell that the wood things that disappear into the forest are bad things because of the shape of the skull, the shape of the profile, the section, form of the section of the buildings. So he said his thing. And then on the other side of the stage was Pont, Henri McLean Pont. And he was married to a Javanese woman, and he understood, as everyone did, the beauty that occurs when uh, a Dutch man marries a Javanese woman. It was uh, a joke then. It was common knowledge that mixed race babies are going to, are going to be are beautiful. And now, if you have a mixed race baby, <laughs> they say, "Oh, bintang film," right? They, so it's everyone thinks that. Um, that's, that's the beautiful combination. And so he alluded to that, and he said, don't just look at Borobudur and Prambanan in their large form. Look at the carvings of Borobudur. All over Borobudur are the depictions of these wooden and bamboo buildings that decay and fall back into the forest. And clearly, there's something important going on here. And, um, and so he made the argument that this is architecture, this is beautiful, this is profound, this is worthy of emulation. So those are the two schools of thought. Schumacher, it's all about India, and then Pont, it's all about wood and bamboo and the brilliance of what he called the greater Sunda tradition. So the greater Sunda condition is what ties all of the architecture of the archipelago of Southeast Asia together. It's one, he's, he called it one big thing, the greater Sunda tradition. 
So Schumacher goes off and he builds Hotel Prangar in Bandung. Um, and he takes a modernist concrete box like everyone does in Java now. Uh, and then he decorates it. But he didn't decorate with the great civilization of India. He decided, because it turns out in his attitude, it doesn't matter what great civilization you refer to. So he used Mayan, the Mayan <laughs> great civilization, right? It's silly. Pant, on the other hand, and this is Gudung Sate. How many people have been to Bandung? Itebe? Okay, so this is uh, Gudung Sate. It has the three layers, Meru, roof, that you see all over here. And this is an example, Pont wasn't the architect of this, but this is an example of a marriage, a hybrid cultural formation of Dutch technology of construction plus the symbolic meaning systems of uh, the greater Sunda tradition. And his most famous building uh, by Pont was, uh, two, was opened two years earlier before the debate. Uh, and it was this, the uh, Itebe, uh, it's influenced by Minangkabau without being totally uh, culturally centric. Uh, so it's, it's the, the intentions of this hybrid was to marry together multiple different cultural elements from throughout Indonesia with Dutch techniques and technology. So there's the Minangkabau, way more swoopy, this is toned down, and the shapes are just different. So. Don't be, so he was careful not to make it a direct replica of Miran Kabao. He adapted it. Are there other obvious cues merged in, or is it just? Well, he tried to mix this uplifting point with other references. And a lot of it is arts and crafts, Frank Lloyd Wright. But the sirap uh, and the, uh, a lot of, you know, the multiple stacked roofs. And uh, he's, I, it hasn't really been taken apart but the, the big roof form is the single biggest formal move that he made. Um, on the inside, it's Dutch framing, Dutch kuda kuda, and uh, everything to just to, um, to make it a proper, technically proper building. But then, uh, and the, th the important thing about this slide, and I don't know if I can enlarge it. I guess I can. Oops. This is tricky. Did any of you study these buildings or these guys in, in school? Yeah? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pat Yiwan. Did you study Indonesian architecture in school? Anyone? Did they cover anything? Did they cover uh, about these guys? So traditional, traditional ones you did. So that was at UI. <coughs> Malang, okay. Um, and did you use Romo Mangun, uh, his book? Yeah, that's a beautiful book. It should be here. You should. Lend your copy. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is, whereas the Minangkabau is a real, a real swoop, this is just a straight, orthogonal, stiff European technology built up a bit to make it lift. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a false form. It's not quite expressive of what the Minangkabau so it's not that. It's a bit stiffer. <clears throat> and inside, it's you know, beautiful. It's still there. You can go see it. Right? You went to th events there. So um, this is Gunawan Chayono's um, heritage, Indonesian Heritage Dictionary uh, Encyclopedia. Do you have that? Fantastic thing. I recommend it also. Um, but volume three is about architecture. And in a very brief space, he just where he, a lot of our friends are all, <laughs> took different sections of Indonesia and wrote just two pages. This is very simple, boom, boom, boom. And um, this is kind of a collection of the different forms of the greater Sunda tradition. And um, I noticed when I visited in 2012, 
that you, in a way, are doing the same thing. You are studying the greater Sunda tradition and learning from what these buildings have to teach us about how to do things. Um, and your father didn't tell me not to do this until after I'd done it. So you kept it. And I've never shown it to anyone until, really? until I came here, <laughs> until last night. It's the first time I used it at this point. So you know what this is. And some of these are your wild creations, but some of them are, hey, how, does, how do the roofs in Sumba work? Right? And so it's just very interesting. And this became, last night I presented this to the students at Bamboo U, and that became the big discussion with Oren uh, and others was um, what role did these models play uh, in learning about how bamboo works. And so I hope to, we can talk about that. But I'm going to move quickly through here. You know, there's all these traditions, and it moved from bamboo into wood. And the interesting thing is that... Um, Sorry, did you say that you think that most of the wooden structures were originally bamboo and then moved into wood? Well, there's a, there's a t conversation happening between the two. Okay. But the poorer you are, the less wood you use because it's too expensive. And I didn't get into this last night. Um, but let me say this one other chunk. Um, is there a bamboo stick somewhere? <laughs> so um, on stage in the debate, back to this debate, Schumacher said, I can prove that the Indonesians don't know anything about true architecture. And he used the evidence that the beams the wooden beams of the roof of Javanese architecture is laying flat. It's tidur, right? And of course, that's wrong from a European perspective. It's just wrong because the moment of inertia is 1 12th bh cubed, so h cubed. So the higher it is, the stiffer it is. And so they clearly don't understand anything because the beams are all flat. And so they bounce and they flex. Um, obviously, um, and is it Sagiempat? It's round. Okay, well, I, I can do it. Yeah, we don't have any splits. A around. split. I should have said split. This one, this one. I have a ruler this over there. A ruler. This one is split. Okay. Yeah. So this one is not. It's a lot stronger, you all know, but just so we know what we're talking about. It flexes eventually, but it's so much stiffer than this way. This is like a rubber band, and this is, and it's because the math is 112 base, the dimension of the base times the height cubed. So if the height is 3, 3 cubed is 27. Um, and so if it's 1 by 3, it's 27. Yeah. Uh, but if it's like this, then the height is 1. And it's nothing. It's, it's, it doesn't have much structural value. So there's a math way of understanding that, and then there's the, the, child, the child way of understanding it, is that we just know it's true. Um, and so Schumacher was making the point, they aren't even as smart as children. You know, they don't, they're, all the beams are tidor. They're not, they're not, uh, it's all Tidor. And so, um, Pont didn't have an answer, and he kind of scratched his head. I think Schumacher might have won the debate, in a way. And so he went off in crisis, but because he was a colonial architect, he did what colonial architects did back then, is he went all over the archipelago, touring it, uh, preaching good hygiene practices. Um, and good ethical practices as in the religious thing. So he was, he was part of the project to annihilate all longhouses. So we didn't want uh, families sleeping in the same building that was uh, just asking for trouble. And so there was this Dutch moral imposition on uh, the islands. Stop sleeping in longhouses. Everyone needs to have their own house. And by the way, bamboo is dirty stop using bamboo. And so that was part of the colonial project, was to get rid of bamboo, get rid of thatch, 
um, to stop doing that. So the part I didn't get into last night is the social aspect of this is that different, uh, when, when there was a community building, like a banjar, um, a bale banjar was being built, everybody in the com community could uh, harvest some bamboo and make a piece. Everyone knew what pieces were needed and every family contributed a piece. And if you were wealthier, you contributed, you know, a more, or if you were more important, you contributed a more important piece of the structure. And so there's this social thing. And everyone knew how to work bamboo because they were making buildings for themselves. Now, after this changed, uh, and they changed from bamboo to timber, timber is more expensive. It takes longer to grow. It takes a certain degree of specialization to carve it, special tools to make the joints. And so all of a sudden it became filled with experts. So the experts came in and the gotong royong function was, was uh, decreased by this change. Um, but while Pont was... Um, so this is two things that Pont noticed, is that... Uh, that this, um, this tradition of bamboo construction was part of an elaborate, complex social uh, system and set of traditions that helped join the community together. Uh, the other thing is that, wow, these roofs, you know, maybe, maybe this is not a mistake. Maybe the bending that Schumacher was ridiculing is actually not a mistake. Maybe it's on purpose. And he did an analysis and um, this was his diagram and I found this after I left Indonesia, after I left Solo, I stopped working with the palace, I went back to the United States and I started looking into this stuff and I found this. It was very exciting for me because he's taking this experience and putting it all together and figuring out what's going on here with the roofs and he said I know what it is. These are tensile structures. And so he starts with a tent. And so he talks about how a tent puts the fabric in tension and the structure and the form is all a result of this tensile arrangement of elements. You have posts and then you have the roof in tension and it droops. And then he went around mostly in Java using examples to say, look, all of these roofs are doing this. And I was really thrilled to see that this example was one of the clearest ones uh, because, according to him, this lower roof is hanging off the upper roof because it's, it's pulling, this is a fulcrum point, and by hanging the weight of the lower roof off the tail end of the rafters, it's lifting up the top, and so it's it's actually lifting it, putting this intention, but also lifting. And, uh, and so, and this building, the Bang Sal Uitono Solo, was a building that um, I was, so there's the fulcrum point that is, because I had done a lot of work on this building when I was in Solo, and in, including trying to figure out what the heck is going on at that fulcrum point. So this is that same building. It's one of the examples of the atap gantong. So it's a hanging roof. The lower roof literally hangs from the upper roof. There's all this heavy, heavy beamwork, but the beamwork seems to be not doing much uh, because the lower roof doesn't even touch it. The lower roof doesn't attach to all this beamwork. What's the deal? Why did they do all this beamwork? Very confusing. And why? what's going on here with these hangers? You can see these... He's uh, basically more, more than about and these bolts. So it's basically hanging up there. And I was measuring and drawing and taking paper from shade castings and trying to figure it out. And I never figured it out until I saw this. Um, and so, um, so that was a th thrilling moment for me. Um, the other thing that I think is true uh, in both the Javanese context and the Balinese context is the importance of the carpenter. As uh, I know it, it's not true anymore 
it's not true in Pete Bamboo, but in the villages, uh, when you want to build an important building, you don't just start on Tuesday when everyone can come. You look at the calendar, you figure out what day to start. We do do that, actually. Oh, you do that. Okay, great. <laughs> and you got to put offerings. He's wearing this ribbon that shows that the, he, if that's a sign to the Queen of the South Seas that she's a friend of the, of the king. And um, don't hurt him. He's a friend. So he comes into the palace. And you can't enter the palace without wearing this or else you're going to get in trouble from the from the goddess going to Sumba and then trying to figure out what you're supposed to do there right <laughs> on the first day <laughs> yeah well they'll tell you yeah um, but the other thing is he's not you know every piece of the building that we call it mortis and tenon you know where the one stick comes into the hole and, and it connects and it makes a very strong connection end of story but in Java and elsewhere that's not the end of the story. The name of each little piece has at least two meanings. One is the technical meaning, where you stick this thing in that thing, and it holds, it's stronger. But then there's a whole set of second meanings that says the male and the female, when they come together, they create a unity that is the basis of all life. So all of a sudden it just exploded in importance to do it right, because these are not just, they're not just functioning to hold the building together. They are also func functioning to hold the cosmos together. So the balance between heaven and earth is important. Uh, and we, the balance in between heaven and earth gets thrown off and you have to correct it with all these sajan and ceremonies. And that's partly what the architecture does. The architecture is an instrument for maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. And the palace in Solo, when there was uh, unrest here, or famine there, or a volcano was rumbling here, there would be offerings in a different position in the palace, because the palace was a like a voodoo doll. It was a map, it was a model of Java. And uh, if you want to fix a problem in the Pasisir to the east, you go to this uh, part of the palace and you give your offerings there. And you do offerings a certain way and they have ceremonies throughout the year to restore the balance. And all of this is very familiar to you. Um, it's a different, different specifics, but it's the same function of things. And uh, so working with this man for four years, uh, he taught me a lot about how these things work in the Javanese world of just joinery and carpentry and building and construction and architecture. And there he is in a more priestly garb. And I don't have to get into this, but um, every measurement is based on uh, the human body. And so the meanings are replicated by the specific way things are measured, by the specific way things are built. So Pont, um, so for the next few decades before the Japanese came, Pont became obsessed with this tensile structure. And he built these buildings instead of using uh, sticks, rang, uso, gording, he, he replaced it with cables. And so he uses cables as the, as the rang. So the, these genteng are hanging off cables. And there's no there's no usuk, uh, there's no solid usuk, the usuk are cables. And so everything, the wind blows and this roof goes clickety clackety and the earthquake happens and it goes clickety clackety and it's, it's alive, it's dynamic and it's still there. Um, so then I visited Bali in 2012, rode my bike out from Ubud. Um, I almost got run over by this crazy guy on a motorbike. Turns out it was your dad. Um, and so this is where I show people in Green School Bali, they are doing, they're tapping into the same uh, potential of bamboo as this living thing. And I show them all these things and I say, um, 
it'd be ni- it'd be nice. I don't know who that is. Who's that? Patyoman. Patyoman. Is he a Nunagi? What's an Unagi? He, is he a priest? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe his mind. <laughs> right. No, he's not. So I said he's probably a priest. I keep that's the way I present it. He's a builder and a designer. He's probably a priest <laughs> because they all are. No. But uh, yeah, I'm learning that that's not true. But Pat Moko's grandfather was an Undagi. Ah. And Pat Moko grew up n- knowing that there were these holy books that showed all the rules, the thousands and thousands of rules for when to do this, why to do this, how to do this, how big should it be. And he's got a very strong awareness of all this stuff. He's not an Undagi, but he knows about it. And they're, the books are called Primbon. You know about Primbon? Because it's true in Java. Primbon. Everyone knows Primbon. Called Primbon. Ada? Ada di Sini? Did Ada? Astrology. Is there a connection? Could you use Primbon here? You, you could? Sometimes? Sometimes you use Primbon? And so I show these things, and actually, my talk is so long and boring. And then I get to this, and everyone's like, oh, everyone's like, oh, show us more of this. They don't want to hear about Schumacher and Pont and uh, structures and moments of inertia stuff, cables. They don't care. They want to see this. And they're like, we love this. Show us more of this. So I don't need to show this to you guys. Um, you, this is just normal for you guys. So, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you. I hope now let's have a big discussion. <laughs> Thank you. So is it two separate worlds, the Primbone world? and the Pete Bamboo world? How many people are from Bali? So maybe starting with you, are any of you Undagi? Are you an Undagi? No? Bapaknya undagi? Lebih enak kalau pakai bahasa Indonesia? Bisa? Now this is hard to find undagi. It's hard to find an undagi? Yes. Because, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. um, call it architect now and mostly undagi will work uh, directly from field to can. Um, maybe we, we still can find Undagi on village, uh, work for to build temple, to build traditional manjang. Mm-hmm. What about the most sacred part of your house in Bali? You just no. do it or do you consult the Undagi? Consult. You consult the Undagi. Still today? Still. Okay. And then there's the Dapur. No one cares. You don't consult the Undagi for the Dapur. Or you do? We, we do. I believe not all now. Mm-hmm. But Is, yeah, uh, Dapur and, and uh, family temple still, still ask. Mm-hmm. Someone who understand. Okay. And they might say, oh, it doesn't matter, just. Uh, do this, and they give you one thing that you have to do, or two things you have to do. Is that how it works? In the dot board, when I mean, it's not Kalokorang Sakral. We have this, uh, Balinese have this, uh, yeah, um, basic, basic architectural placement. Asta Kusala Kusale, could you give you that? No, I want, I need a copy. Asta Kusala Kusale. So, 
like in Java, the house is a microcosmos. Yes. Uh, it represents Bali, uh, Bali, Bali Island. Yes. So, like here, when we live at, uh, I'm not an expert in traditional architecture. Of course not. Look <laughs> at you. <laughs> uh, basically, Balinese, um, the placement of the house, traditional house, based on the mountain and the Kajakalot, yeah. Yeah, and the Pantai. Right. So, uh, if you live on the on the what's the name? Selatan, uh, on the yeah, Kaja is is Kaja is, is yeah, north. Kaja is yeah. north. Kalod is south. Yeah. Yeah. So Kaja is mean Kaja. So that gets into the basic arrangement of the household. Yeah. But yeah. what about the questions that come up that are not clear? Like everyone knows you got to do this. You get the family temple has to be in this most sacred place. The garbage goes here. The head of the household goes in the ballet. This one here. So yeah. everyone knows that. But when you when you go to build, what do you have to figure out? Like, oh, I better, who do you, why would you have to ask a question to the undagi or look at the book? Why would you have to open the book? Uh, and do they? Do you? Uh, I think everybody needs to know uh, where to put the, 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 those two is the most, yeah. the most the kitchen and the temple. Mm -hmm. So, usually temple is Kajakangin, uh, northeast, mm -hmm. and here. The poor is north northwest. Southwest. It's southwest. Southwest and west. Southwest and west. So yeah, we we know that. Uh, I don't know. I know that too. So maybe, yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know more than me. So, yeah, basically those two should be in the uh, position. Yes. The other. But maybe the other. But in this game, the other is expert. Who is? Putra. Putri? Paputra. Paputra. <laughs> Did you know about the tension thing, Putra? The, uh, the no, the tension. the tension. Did you know it was in tension, the building? The roof? In tension? Did you know about that? Well, the Sumba, I saw in your model yeah. that the Sumba roof is also, it passes over a fulcrum and then the lower roof hangs on the upper yeah, roof. The the yeah. So. So the, I've been told in Java, uh, Adi Morsid, who's a famous architect in Jakarta, he was saying, he knows a lot about the traditional Javanese, he said, this is so that the, the roof is actually reaching up to the heavens, and uh, it's actually lifting up. And um, so that's, that's one thing. But the other thing is that it's supposed to droop. And the lifting up actually takes away some of that droop. So it's it's dynamic. So it droops depending on the forces. Even with shingles, though? Wow. Even with shingles. I think it moves just very, very little. Or maybe it doesn't move at all. Maybe it just gets locked. But they think of it. You know, it might not, it, it might be just um, operating as the buildings themselves are instruments of uplifting towards heaven. And... The way it's built, it's just always doing that, um, whether it really moves at all or not. But that's the load pattern, that the downward loads coming down to the footings and into the earth are counteracted by some of those forces translate upward, which in the context of the Shoemaker, Schumacher, Pont uh, debate is pretty sophisticated. How many of our buildings in the United States Where, Was there tension lift? in buildings 100 years ago in the Western world? 
there's always tension on the bottom of the beam, you know, so it's deflecting, it's going in tension, and that's the only tension we can deal Not with. Not like this. Or racking, you know, you have lateral loads, and so you you, you brace buildings t to resist wind loads, and by some of the elements are going in tension. And in shear loading, there's, there's a combination, there's a pattern of compression and tension. So there's, com there's a lot of tension internally in elements, but we tend to avoid tension because we're not comfortable with tension. But the Inca and the Maya talk about great civilization. Some historians have thrown off uh, uh, a theory that the way they defeated the conquistadors so much is because everything they did was in tension. And the conquistadors were all doing everything in compression. So they had bolos and uh, you know, uh, suspension bridges that the conquistadors, the horses wouldn't go over, the conquistadors wouldn't go over. So the suspension bridges created barriers that slowed down the conquest of the Spanish and the Portuguese. So it's a really interesting thing that um, Europe is not a tension place. We're a compression place. You said the Dutch literally banned bamboo? They uh, had an aggressive campaign to get rid of bamboo, and they told the heads of villages, you need to stop people from using bamboo for their houses. It's not modern. And what was their main concern? Uh, animals and decay and uh, you know, uh, rats and insects and disease and mold and moisture retained in the thatch. And I had a Vietnamese student from Vietnam and we were talking about bamboo, bamboo this, bamboo that. And uh, he lives way out in the village in Vietnam and he says his uncle has a bamboo piece of his house and people uh, give him a hard time and he's been pressured by the head of his village now today to replace that part. It shouldn't be bamboo, that's not modern. And well, neither is wood. You know, wood houses are for poor people. Proper houses are steel reinforced concrete frame with brick infill plastered and that's kind of the aluminum roof. And yeah, aluminum roof. So So there's a lot of pressure to do that. But I am I'm very interested in um, the idea that there are still undagi. So there are still undagi in the villages. Someone find this guy in undagi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there an undagi in the house? No. <laughs> so maybe I can. They can help me find an undagi. I mean, when we want to do offerings for the house before we build, we just do it with the local priest, not an undagi, right? What kind of we call just a data. Undagi. Oh, to consulting with the building itself. Yeah. And doing it. He's so he might look to us like a tukan. Yes. Well, that's why I asked because, and that's why I speculated because, you know, undagis don't walk around with a T-shirt that says "I'm an undagi," and they don't walk around advertising that they're undagi. But everyone knows when you're going to do something, you go talk to, you know, Wyan. So I don't know. So to us, they look, they're, they're hiding, they're impersonating Tukang, but they're actually in Uh-huh. Any think. other questions, guys? Pertanyaan? So now that you've done all your studies, had a good uh, sort of background of leading up to it and you specialize and you teach and talk about this. What is next for you? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just, I'm here and this is, this is, I'm going to carve some pegs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's next for me. Yeah. I'm going well, to carve some more, yeah. I'm going to be more careful about the, the skin. Yeah. Hariini, khusus hariini, dan kebanyakan from basket weaving. Oh. 
pembuatan keranjang. But I bet if I made these guys be baskets, they'd all cut their hands too. <laughs> What do you think? Uh, they're saying, give me an exacto knife. I can't handle this <laughs> Bali blade. But um, I, I'm, I'm working on a house in Java. It's in construction, and part of it is in phase three. And so I'm fantasizing about what a bamboo version of what the client is looking Aha. for. It's a library. So it's, it's a traditional house. It's um, he's a, a, a Wyong drummer, and she's a PhD scholar of shadow puppet performance. And so I brought in a lot of what I learned from the palace. They just want a, a nice Dutch colonial house, but they're going to be having Y and Shadow Puppet plays there every month. Very, very important ones in solo. And so I'm trying to uh, sneak in the important religious things of Y on, because it's very important. And um, they're very open to some of it. Other stuff So no, don't call it a krobongan. Call it a green room. This is where the performers get ready for the performance. This is where they put on their pakean da. Um, don't call it a krobongan. It's a green room. It says, okay. But we know what it is. It's a krobongan. So it's, there's a lot of that. We make a bamboo joglo. A bamboo joglo. With all the... Yeah. And, and the hanging. It all of a sudden becomes a lot like uh, uh, Luma Sumba. But different yeah. proportions. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what's next. But this is being published. This, the, the long, How do we see it? boring version. I can, um, I think I put it up on my academia.edu website. But if I haven't, I will. Send us the link. Okay. And then Renata, share the press kit so you can get some fresh photos. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for helping me with Such my a research. Treat to have a bit of education in the middle of the day, a bit of storytelling. Yeah. Now it's time to get back to work.